I look around the room and I say, wow, it's just one of the changes in my, in my life as I get older. I suddenly seem to have people paying attention to what I say. <laughs> and sometimes it worries me because it's if I've changed what I've been saying or whatever. Um, anyways, I hope I won't bore you too much tonight and uh, we'll see how this goes. Uh, two things I should mention is that this is, uh, I'm trying to feel my way through a different way of thinking about history, which we'll get to in a second. So I really would like your sense as to whether what I'm talking about makes any sense. It makes sense to me, but we'll, we'll find out. The second thing is that, much to my dismay, when I printed out the text today, it's 34 pages, double space, which will take me about two hours to read. Yeah. So I'm editing as I go. So uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully if, you, if you fall asleep, I'll understand. <laughs> So uh, I'd like to begin, too, by again acknowledging this as the traditional and unceded territory of the Lekwungen-speaking peoples. And I also want to thank the San Jesus Poema and Wasonic peoples who are guardians of this territory, past, present, and future, for allowing it to use it today. Uh, I begin with this acknowledgement, not just for reasons of political correctness or, uh, or what today might be even be considered to be common courtesy, but because without such knowledge, such acknowledgement, it's all too easy to forget that we live at the tail end of history of colonization and racist exclusion that continues into the present. It also means that there are people among us who have very different connections to this place than people like me. Some people, such as myself, this connection is a matter of a few others. For others, it's one that goes back as long as human memory goes back anywhere in the world, in effect, to the beginning of time. And then that we need to remind ourselves of this through such an acknowledgement is in many ways the point of my talk today. I'm also deeply honored to be giving the Neil Burton Memorial Lecture. Um, as mentioned, I knew Neil Burton when he was a PhD student uh, at McGill in 1973. And Neil went to China in the first cohort in 1972-73. And I went in the fourth in 1976-78. Uh, to, to I also have other connections, so for those of you who know the Burton family, it was also uh, his brother Don, student <coughs> at, at, at UBC. I took a course with him on Japanese history, I was even his teaching assistant. Um, and, but I most remember uh, Neil and his family from 1976 to 78, when I was in China, and he was a foreign expert there uh, with his family. It's important to note that at the time we were in Beijing, in ways that I think are very hard to understand now, China wasn't really part of this world that we're in here now. Socially, politically, and even in terms of distance, uh, it wasn't connected to this place. It was possibly the furthest place in the world uh, from here. Right? You couldn't even fly directly to China from Canada or anywhere else in the Western world. Um, you. you uh, uh, today, it takes a flight of a little over 12 hours, depending on where you're leaving from. At that time, it would take, it would take as long as five days to get to Beijing from, uh, from Montreal, where I was living. You had to go to Hong Kong via Tokyo. You then took the train to the border. You walked across the border at Shenzhen, which was a sleepy little fishing village with a tiny little outpost, little railway bridge. You then took the train to, to Guangdong. And then from there, it was a day and a half by train to Beijing. Um, uh, I arrived in China uh, 10 days before Mao Zedong died. Uh, the Cultural Revolution was in full swing. There were almost no foreigners there. There were the foreign diplomats and their families. There were 300 foreign experts like Neil and, and often with their families, and a few thousand foreign students, mainly from the third world. There were a few tourists. And those that were there had to always come on an official China travel service tour with, a, with an official guide. And outside of Beijing and Shanghai, foreigners would be followed around quite literally by crowds of hundreds of people because they had never even uh, seen foreigners before. And China was the hidden kingdom as mysterious to people in the West as it had been before the Opium Wars uh, of the 19th century. And the opening up of China to the world was only beginning when I left in 1978. In fact, the rehabilitation of Deng Xiaoping was only officially announced as I was on route home. I returned to China for the first time after th an absence of 36 years in 2014. 
And what struck me most was not the incredible transformation of Chinese cities and the amazing infrastructure, um, the efficiency of the Beijing subway system, for example. But what struck me the most is the ways in which China is today connected to the rest of the world. For good or for ill, much the same products available here are available there. Wang Fujing in Beijing is disturbingly reminiscent of Times Square in Hong Kong. Hollywood films are shown in the theaters. You can buy the recent issue of Vogue magazine on the corner newsstand. Meanwhile, the internet connects me to my university servers at home. Newspapers and television internet news feeds report on many international stories much the way they do here. And most of all, people go in and out of the country relatively <coughs> unhindered. And today, foreigners are virtually unnoticed in even the smaller centers. Uh, so China today is part of my world. Students from China take my classes at the University of Ottawa. I even have the card of the Xinhua News Agency uh, uh, bureau chief in Ottawa in my, in my Rolodex. It's not really a Rolodex, in the pile of cards that I have. <laughs> and uh, I regularly deal with the education delegation of the Chinese Embassy for business reasons. And in fact, on Wednesday, I'm flying to Wuhan, where I'm going to spend two weeks visiting the Faculty of Education of Central China Normal University. But as much as we are connected to people and things Chinese today, there's a powerful sense in which China remains the unknown country to people in Canada. The connections that we live do not translate into the depth of knowledge needed for genuine understanding to develop common projects around the problems of our time. And it's this connectedness and their effacement in the networks of cultural representation that surround us that I'd like to explore with you today. I am proposing a different way of doing history, one that does not read things through the lens of nationalizing accounts, but seeks instead connection to people and to others around them, and indeed, and indeed to others at some distance removed in time and place, through what I've come to call a pedagogy of connection. We begin with a microspace such as this room, and the people and things here in this moment. And we trace outwards and backwards through time the material, embodied, and symbolic connections that make this place and that have remade this place over time. And although in this example I'm concerned with this present moment in this place, this can also be done in terms of other places and other times as well. Um, I'm going to argue that much as we are connected to other parts of the world materially and in embodied ways, the cultural landscapes around us are marked and labeled in ways that do not privilege particular histories of dominance, but squash the representation of the lived connections that we have to people and places and things in the rest of the world. Um, my uh, well, a brilliant PhD student of mine, uh, Nicole Grant, and I have theorized this marking as the wallpaper of dominance. Wallpaper because it's in the background, normally unnoticed and less torn, otherwise a banal pattern that repeats. But also wallpaper because it papers over the actual creation and recreation of dominance. And it seems to me that it's this wallpaper that enables racist violence and hides the ongoing violence of colonialism by naturalizing the presence of certain kinds of bodies, certain languages and certain cultural practices as part of this place, as somehow belonging, while representing other bodies, languages, and practices, alien, exotic, things that are not of this place and don't belong. And it seems to me this is the kind of thing that licenses the racist trolls who deface the How Do You Challenge White Supremacy poster, uh, and allow them to think that they and not others belong here. So one way of thinking about this wallpaper is in the names that surround us. We live in a world filled with signs, street signs, traffic signs, advertisements, uh, brands, logos, words in our mapping apps on our cell phones. And these signs tell us that we're in the city of Victoria, an English name, and a name that's generally unquestioned by first language English speakers who are the majority here. This, too, is a pattern that continually repeats, as we'll see this dominance of English. Yet, in fact, Victoria is named after this person, Queen Victoria. 
who was an English monarch uh, of the same name, who lived on the other side of the world. In fact, at the time Victoria was named Victoria, the Pacific Northwest was the furthest place in the world from England. It took a bit of six to eight months to a year to get here. And the actual naming was an expression of British power, enforced by the gunboats sitting in the harbor, and as such, it in itself was an act of colonialism. <coughs> One that silenced the Lokwangan name, a name that had been used for thousands of years. So today, except for the kind of acknowledgement that I began with, it seems that English speakers, and not Lokwangan speakers, belong in this territory. Similarly, people refer, without reflection, to the name of this province, British Columbia. British Columbia is named after the Columbia Territory, and the British was added, allegedly at the suggestion of Queen Victoria, to differentiate it from the country of Columbia that was being established in South America at the same time. Again, we might want to think about the power relations involved here. Let's say today that we decided to name the city of London, England, after me. <laughs> Timothyville, I think, has a nice ring. <laughs> but what kind of power would we have to use to not only agree amongst ourselves, I guess I have to shut the door and won't bring you out before it happens, but to make sure that the name sticks in London itself. Beyond this, the Columbia Territory was named after the Columbia River, which was named after the SS Columbia fur trading vessel sent out by John Jacob Astor from New England, which in turn was named after this person. Christopher Columbus, the alleged discoverer of America, even though at the time of his discovery, two-fifths of the world people lived in the Americas and didn't know that they needed to be discovered. <laughs> but Columbus was also responsible, amongst his greater claims to fame, for organizing the genocide of the Arawak people on the island of Hispaniola. So every time we refer to British Columbia, leaving aside the imperialist grab evidence in the naming of it British, we celebrate a murderer of thousands of people. And maybe indeed this is a, a, appropriate if we consider that the state system named by British Columbia rests on the genocide and the attempted genocide of the peoples who have lived in this territory since the beginning of time. To give a more local example of the kind of thing that I need, um, this is the, consider the Victoria School District's George J. School. This school is named after the longtime chair of the Victoria School Board, George J. Uh, he, was, he was chair for, some, for almost 30 years, so he was, he was quite influential in the uh, early 20th century, late 19th century. Amongst other things, he founded, by the way, Victoria College, which later becomes the University of Victoria. He also built like the school, George J. School, which is named after him. Yet he was also the principal force behind the racist segregation of Chinese Canadians and argued for their segregation throughout his career, spanning several decades. And one reading of this is that the only reason that the George J. School in Victoria today is not racially segregated is not because George J. saw the error of his ways, but it's because of the resistance of Chinese Canadians to their segregation, including the 1922-23 student strike that they organized when the school board sought to extend a partial system of segregation applying to recently arrived students from China who didn't speak English, to one that affect all racialized Chinese students. And something to think about here is what are we teaching young people when we name the school after George J, rather than, for example, Joe Hope, or Lo Kong Zhou is his Chinese name was, who was the second generation Chinese Canadian who led the student struggle. For a long time, I've been critical of nationalist approaches to the past, and histories tend to be told from the point of view of particular national communities and actors. Meanwhile, studying and teaching tends to be organized along national lines. So we tend to be historians of 19th century India or 20th century France. The problem, as I've argued, is that these histories, at least in Canadian contexts, cannot account for the racisms and colonial violence that have made and continue to make this place called Canada. While as the new Canada Hall of the Canadian Museum of History shows, it's possible to make a more inclusive history to represent indigenous peoples, for example, as actors throughout Canadian history, for example. 
uh, or to represent what the museum would call the two sides of Johnny MacDonald, his role as nation maker and his white supremacy and genocide of indigenous peoples. This history still def denies both the effect of racism and colonialism in not just making injustice, but in making dominance and in subjugating people in ways that continue into today. It also erases the connected ways in which human beings have actually lived in this territory called Canada, connected to others outside of nationally and politically organized boundaries. Uh, this includes, for example, the ways in which Johnny McDonald's activities himself of nation building were part and parcel of British imperialism, a fact that he celebrated. In fact, he's probably the most successful British imperialist of the 19th century. This land grab in the Hudson's Bay Company first this, that I think is the single largest land grab in the history of British Empire. The project of Canada was very much a local <laughs> part of a much larger product of British and European imperialism that came to dominate the world. And indeed, nationalizing approaches tend to erase the connections that many of us actually have, whether to relatives and friends in other countries, or indeed, if you come from the part of Canada where I come from, where you try to travel to on your holidays. Um, and this is not new. We know that the indigenous peoples of Canada had long lived connected to others. So I live within Ottawa, which is on the traditional and city territory of the Ashinaabe Algonquin. And I'm within a stone's throw, throw of Chaudière Falls, and the place where the Ottawa, Gatineau, and Rideau rivers meet. And for thousands of years, this was the place where all the indigenous peoples of northeastern North America met. <clears throat> and to give another example that I just learned about recently, apparently Dene and Navajo are basically the same language. When you become a director of an institute of indigenous and aboriginal studies, you learn things like that. Uh, so, so Navajo is southern Dene. Right? Who knew? Um, I guess they did. <laughs> I'm also not convinced that an exposure to an inclusive history changes the points of view or understandings of the racist poles who defaced the poster. It would have been helpful to explain to the woman who asked Jagmeet Singh, the new NDP leader, whether he was going to impose Sharia law, to explain that in fact he's a Sikh and not a Muslim, <laughs> or that there aren't that many Muslims in Canada to begin with. And the ones who are here don't really want to impose Sharia law on anybody. Um, recently, the cultural anthropologist Ghassan Hajj uh, from Australia has noted what he calls the failure of anti-racism, an analysis that I regretfully agree with. He argues that anti-racists have, have approached combating racism much the way we do in academic debate, correcting mistaken premises and providing more secure knowledge and that we failed utterly to address the effective conditions that make it believable that Mr. Singh is a cover for the Islamicization of Canada and allows the trolls to engage in their violence without ever having to confront the human consequences of their actions. And here I think it might be useful to remember Hannah Arendt's conclusion about the social basis of totalitarianism. In her landmark study, The Origins of Totalitarianism, she asked what made totalitarianism possible? What made the program of the Nazis and Stalin possible? What allowed the perpetrators of the Holocaust, for example, to work eight to four shifts, murdering people, and to return home to their families at night? What enabled Stalin's purges and imposed famines and the murder of millions to be done in the name of building socialism? And her conclusion is at once devastating and I think a must read for all critical scholars. She said the social basis of totalitarianism was not the actual brilliance of the movement, if you want, in some terms, or their ruthlessness. It was rather what she called the most radical and most common of human experiences, loneliness. She argued that the totalitarian program was to sever the ordinary links that bind people together, what she called the common sense that more than one person lives in the world, a sense that arises from daily interactions with others, so the sharpness of our ideas get lost. Instead, the lonely man, as she called him in the sexist idiom of her time, could follow the logic of an idea to its ultimate conclusion until it defined common sense the sense that we gain from living together in a common world. <clears throat>
It seems to me nationalist histories of any kind cannot create the connections needed to counter this severing of common links. Because ultimately the goal of every nationalism is to create an us and a them, and if need be, to mobilize this us to murder that them. Instead, it seems to me, we need to find a way of binding us together, an approach to history that connects people together in ways that would make the idea of a troll attack unthinkable. And it seems to me, uh, understanding the microspaces we inhabit through a pedagogy of connection across time and place and distance is vital to addressing what Arendt would have called the problems of our time. And the challenge is that the wallpaper of dominance papers over our materially embodied and symbolic uh, suggest, uh, connections so they're not recognized. So let me illustrate what I mean here. Um, first, um, what I'm talking about is a, is a, is a pedagogy of, of connection. I come from a faculty of education, so I have to talk about pedagogy. <laughs> but it's, it's, think about histories of microspaces outwards and back. So we can look at this place, this room. How did this space come to be as a material space? How did everything in it, the chairs, the walls, the, the seats, the, the glass, the design, how did that come to be here? You know, where does a drywall come? 70% of the world's drywall apparently comes from Nova Scotia. Maybe that's where that comes from. Yeah. Um, uh, how is this space constructed symbolically? So if we look around the room, what do we see? Well, I see a lot of Roman letters. Well, let's think about this. These are letters that were invented in ancient Rome on the other side of the world, thousands of miles away, thousands of years ago, yet they're here. And then how else is this, is this space symbolically constructed? What language am I speaking? It's interesting I'm speaking English and not Lepwangan. It's interesting that the organizers of this event, who I thank sincerely for organizing it, did not see fit to translate my talk into Lukwangan. Right. And if I was in Lukwangan, how many of us here would actually understand that? Right. So there's, there's an artifacting going on here. It also exists in how this space comes to be embodied. So how did each of us as a body get to be here? What's our own histories that leads us to be in this room at this time? Okay, some of you were misinformed. You thought it was a different <laughs> talk. Mistakes <laughs> happen, but that's the, that's the same thing. But beyond that, we read our bodies in terms of different categories, in terms of gender, sexualities, age, professorialness, you know, uh, non-professorialness, thank God, <laughs> etc. And these categories are themselves creations that are invented by people, made by people and so forth. So everywhere we look in our world, it's made by human beings. Even wilderness today is made by human beings who, uh, who through the decision not to develop it. All right? And it's this making that is in part a kind of magic. It means that at any given moment, we are surrounded by ghosts. Ghosts being the unseen human minds and hearts and hands that made the world we invented. And it seems to me that if we can trace these connections between people, over, including back through time, we can create connections that actually solve that problem of loneliness uh, talked by Aaron. So let me give you a uh, an example of this, um, if I can find the right pace in my, in my stuff. Okay? How many of you have cell phones? <laughs> okay. So, something to think about is that the cell phone in your pocket actually connects you quite literally to the world. Right? 70% of the world's cell phones are, are, are constructed in a single factory in Shenzhen, in China. This is the Apple portion of it. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I, I am an Apple. <laughs> you, 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 I figure you have to decide which multinational corporation you're going to sell your soul to. <laughs> <laughs> right? 
Um, that's your cell phone, whether you know it or not, actually directly connects you to thousands of Chinese workers and through them to their families and communities in China. But if it goes beyond this, you know, it was originally designed in California. <coughs> Software engineering was done in India. The different apps come from all over the place. All right? The rare earths that make the screen comes from different parts of Africa. The distribution and service networks are locally made. So you have to, in a cell phone, literally a device that is made by the world. Now, I'm not a great fan of globalization, but this is a pretty neat aspect to it. If you think that even more remarkably, it can connect you directly to four billion other human beings who are the people who have access to the, to the internet. This has never been possible before in human history to have a human conversation on that stand. Now, at a whole other level, the fact that your cell phone was made in Shenzhen would say, well, that's about China, that's about us, it's got nothing to do with us here in Victoria. It's got nothing to do with the history of people here in Victoria, so, so what are we talking about? But in fact, I'm going to argue they're directly connected through what I argue was the most important political event ever to have been taken place in what is today Canada, which took place in Victoria in 1899. Right? As you may know, at the time British Columbia entered Confederation, this was an indigenous to territory, in which there were only a few thousand non-indigenous peoples. That's in 1871. And as the historical geographers Cole Harris and Robert Galois have argued, and indeed many a historian of the Chinese in Canada have argued, the Chinese were a significant group in this territory, as were the European colonizers. In fact, uh, I think there's some evidence to suggest they were the majority of the non-indigenous population. And from the moment of their arrival, they participated in the civic life of the emerging community, voting in elections, for example, contributing to the subscription campaign that built the Royal Jubilee Hospital. They cleared the land, built the roads, dikes, mines for gold, traded with First Nations. Despite this, or perhaps because of it, the third act of the British Columbia legislature banned so-called Chinamen, along with First Nations people, from voting. And by the late 1890s, disenfranchisement had made other invidious policies possible against the Chinese. Other legislation banned them from the federal boat. The immigrant workers and their family members had to pay the head tax. People of Chinese origins were largely ghettoized in Chinatowns, while dozens later close to 200 provincial pieces of legislation barred them from working for the government on Crown Fibra licenses, and popular violence closed many parts of British Columbia uh, of the territory to them. On the face of this, the Chinese fought back organizing mutual aid associations, using the courts to challenge the worst legislation, sometimes successfully, organizing politically, such as forming the Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association in this city, which David Lai has correctly characterized as a Chinese government in Canada. But still, exclusion and violence persisted. Now, uh, these immigrants were uh, connected to people and things Chinese. So this is an example. This is uh, Yip Song, who was the major uh, uh, leading Chinese merchant. He lived in Vancouver in this period. He'd actually uh, uh, had helped build the railroad. <laughs> uh, he was fluent in English, amongst other things. Um, and uh, he also subscribed, and you can see it in his, in his, in his archive of collection, the city of Vancouver, to uh, a, news, a news magazine that came out of Yokohama, Japan, on current events in China. It was published in Chinese. Right? So people like you were connected to developments in China. They were aware of such things as the self-strengthening movement that had started in China during the Taiping Rebellion, or Revolution, and through which China had, had been uh, seeking to get, regain the wealth and power of the West, so that it could assert itself in the face of the aggression of the foreign powers. That's when news reached them of the Hundred Days Reform Movement in 1898, they were hopeful that a strong China would mean they would no longer be oppressed uh, in British Columbia. When the Empress Dowager Zixi ended the reform through a palace coup, imprisoning her nephew, the Kangxi Emperor, and ordering the execution of the leading reformers, the instigator of the reform, Kang Youwei, was able to flee the country, first to Japan, and then in the midst of rumors of assassins personally dispatched by the Empress Dowager, arrived in Victoria, B.C. 
In Victoria, he was greeted by Yip On, the nephew of Yip Song, who had been sent here by Yip Song uh, to, uh, to, to talk to him. And there, in 1890, here in 1899, in conjunction with leading Chinese merchants of British Columbia, he founded the Chinese Empire Reform Association, or Bao Huang Hui. I have to be careful as I talk here, because the real expert on this is my colleague, uh, Jungping Chen, who knows this all much better than me and will correct me when I get all this wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So he formed the Bao Huang Hui in, in Victoria, 1899. This is the first political party in Chinese history. By 1903, it had a worldwide membership of half a million people. It pioneered the organizing systems and in overseas Chinese communities and so forth, later used by Sun Yat-sen and the Revolutionary Party in creating the Nationalist Revolution. As such, it is the direct precursor to the Chinese Communist Party, an organization today that has a mere 90 million members and is responsible for the policies of self-strengthening that created the special economic development zone in Shenzhen that brought you the cell phone in your pocket. So we are surrounded by material connections of this kind. Think for a moment about the, about the pathway outside this, this, this building that connects to a roadway that in fact connects to every roadway in the Americas, even if you do have to take a ferry. Right? This too is a connection. These are connections that people have made, that, that people live. Right? Whether it's the coffee that you're drinking, or it's the clothes you wear, or, or uh, you know, the pencil you're writing with, whatever. These material things connect us to other human beings across and despite difference. So I start with the idea of material connection, in part because of my former Marxist heritage, but, um, but, uh, but I fundamentally start with it because this is the thing, these material connections are the things that actually allied difference. You know, how the material goods are distributed in ways that are inequitable actually creates difference. But, but, but the things that we use that make our world have been made by human beings despite difference and across difference, and in some senses, through difference. Right. So that's just, just uh, one example that I want to give uh, of this kind of connection. Yeah. Um, so the other second thing uh, in my framework, which I, I'm not going to spend too much time on, because if I do, I will be here till midnight. Um, is, is, the, is the idea of, uh, of how, uh, how this space comes to be as a manufactured as a symbolic place. And one of the things that marks it is the dominance of English. Right? Uh, or in, in where I come from at the University of Ottawa, we, we allow some French here and there. Because we are, <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's still the dominance of English, although I do go to administrative meetings where everybody speaks French, so... The administration at the University of Ottawa is dominant French, but the rest of the place is dominant English. Um, okay, so how did this get to be here? All right. This is actually a process that was constructed. The dominance of English was constructed in the first place by creating the power of the colonizing British state. And it was created on this territory through the use of gunboats, up through the 1850s, 1860s, there were multiple villages that were shelled by gunboats, which is the most highly developed military technology in the world in the 19th century, was the Royal Navy gunboat used here. In fact, the last gunboat action was in the early 20th century. The last time in this country that military action was used against uh, indigenous people was in Gustafson Lake in the 1990s. In, 19, in 1990, they, they brought F-118 fighter jets at treetop level, or the village of Ganesataki, every 15 minutes during the Oka crisis. So this is not just a distant past that military force has been used. It's still used to create dominance. Right? But it was also extended, as we know, gradually from, the, from what was in cannon range of the Royal Navy, through statescraft, through 
uh, alliances, through, uh, through uh, uh, a series of different policies to sort of uh, overtake the, the whole territory. Later, when, the, when Canada established 18, 1871, it's also, the, the state system also then develops to exclude uh, indigenous people, to exclude people of Asian origin uh, from the emerging state structures. And then schools, state government controlled schooling, take this and cement it into the stuff of our everyday lives. Okay? We see this most explicitly in the residential schools, which have explicit policies of preventing indigenous children from speaking and learning and using their languages, but the day schools did the same things. And provincially controlled public schools also made English the dominant language. For a while in Ontario, the legislation was, it was the only language of instruction. Right? Uh, on the prairies, there used to be bilingual German and English schools, and then they were all converted into English-only schools. So if English is here dominant, it's because it's been made to be dominant by actually extinguishing the languages of the people that were here and marginalizing the rest of us who speak other languages. So this is actually a process that's a, that's a lived creation. But the problem that continues here is, that, uh, is, is how this all gets related to how we embody this place. Okay? We live through a, a, a process of, of uh, uh, embodied ways. Um, and in some ways, how we were embodied get, gets read against the wallpaper of dominance, gets read against the sign system. This is what uh, the feminist scholar Nirmal Puar calls uh, somatic, somatic dissonance and somatic consonance. Some bodies are read as belonging because you know, they come from places where English is dominant. They, it's about English and, and, and so forth. Um, and and, and uh, whiteness gets marked in this territory in similar ways. And, and so it goes. Right. So, um, so part of what I've been arguing here is that uh, uh, this whole, whole thing gets read, you know, who we are gets read against these processes of marking. So part of the solution, it seems to me, is to actually remark the territory in ways that um, uh, make it more complicated. That actually, you know, the city of Toronto, which I generally don't look to for much of anything, but the, the city of Toronto, to its credit, is in the process of adding in the, depending on where they are in the city, the local indigenous language in every street sign. As they renew the street signs, they're putting in the indigenous transliterations for this. This is a way of actually marking the fact that you know, indigenous people have been there for thousands of years longer than the other, other people. Right? Um, there's, one, uh, there's one phenomenon that I sort of want to talk about uh, just, just fairly quickly that sort of brings all three of these things home. And this is such a taken for granted notion to us that we actually don't think about it too much. And that's the idea of private property. Everything we see here is property. We even see ourselves in terms of property. And people who engage in violence against others also see them as property that they can violate quite literally. All right? But this notion of property is itself a product of this history of exclusion and violence. So I'll give you an example of how this comes to me. So, so you know, our notions of, of property are common law property that come from England and it's part and parcel of this colonizing property. Okay? But uh, my favorite example is around this man. Uh, so John A. MacDonald, as, as we know, is celebrated as the father of this country. Maybe all of you wonder who the mother was. Um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, he's mistakenly called first prime minister. It's not true. Mackenzie King was the first prime minister at the time MacDonald was prime minister. The, the, the only prime minister was the head of government of the United Kingdom. Uh, but that's just a historical thing. Yeah. But MacDonald, uh, in his career, is noted, is, is, there's two significant things that he does. So 1885, during the Dominion Franchise uh, Act, piece of legislation he called his greatest triumph, by the way. Uh, he created a, system, a federal voting system based on ownership of property. 
And he excluded from that federal voting system people of Chinese origin. At first, he said, uh, and ex they introduced a, a, an amendment and ex uh, defining a person as excluding a Chinese. When a member of the opposition asked if people from Hong Kong were Chinamen, he thanked the member and changed it to read, excluding a person of, China, of, of Mongolian or Chinese race. This, as far as I know, the first time in the British Empire that race biologically defined is used to determine political rights. And the fact that he had to do this, by the way, shows how it was not common sense at the time that people in Hong Kong who were British subjects were of Chinese race. So you had to actually make that connection for people, something that had to be invented. When pushed by the opposition to question him, they said that this was, you know, they're as good British subjects as you, and the Chinese in Montreal are fine upstanding men, and so forth, uh, he retreated into even more racist arguments. He said the Chinese, if they came to, if they would control the vote in British Columbia, and they would then send their representatives to Ottawa, and in the even balance of parties, they would impose their alien ideas and Asiatic principles on us, right? And he went on to say, Chinese need to be excluded because the cross, the, the cross of the Asiatic and the Caucasian is like the cross of the fox and the dog, and it cannot be sustained. And if the Chinese come to Canada, we should have a mongrel race and the Aryan nature of the future of British North America should be destroyed. So MacDonald's vision was of an Aryan nation, right, by which he meant a pure, white, unspoiled nation. Right? What's interesting, people say, well, he was a racist, so was everybody else. In fact, his comments shocked the House of Commons. You can, you can read it in Hansard, just you can hear people going, I can't believe he's saying this. When his legislation that he called his greatest triumph reached the Senate, the Senate, his own appointees, debated whether they could get away with voting it down. And many of them voted against it or absented themselves from the vote because of its racist measures. The very next piece of legislation, Chinese Immigration Act, though we have a full explanation for this. His Quebec lieutenant, the head, the, the Adolf Chauvelin, who had also been the royal commissioner on Chinese immigration, <laughs> explained to the House of Commons that what we need to do is keep the Chinese out. And he quoted John Sebastian Helmkin, who was one of the upstanding members of BC society, saying, "We the reason we want to keep the Chinese out is because we want to be here ourselves, and we don't want others to be here." In other words, what this was about was creating a system of power based on ownership of private property. Problem. <laughs> Actually, there was this whole bunch of stuff, territory, that already existed that other people actually already controlled, called indigenous peoples. So we see this quite deliberately in the other part of MacDonald in his invention of the whole system of Indian affairs and its management and residential schools. But we see it most strongly following uh, the Northwest, or during the Northwest uh, Rebellion. Uh, in 1885, the main political actions, the military actions, were not against the Métis, they were against the Plains Cree, who hadn't taken treaty. All right? At following the uprising, MacDonald um, not only arguably engineered the political assassination of Louis Riel, he also uh, engineered the execution of the alleged perpetrators of the uh, massacre at Duck Lake in a trial that took place in Battleford, Saskatchewan, in which the defendants were provided with no translation, in which there was no uh, defense made possible. They were all convicted and publicly hung. By the way, public executions were no longer legal in Canada at the time. In the presence of the children from the battle, from the uh, Capel Indian Residential School, by the way, just to replace the point. He then declared 27 bands to be an insurrection could find them on, on reserve using an illegal system of past laws, of, of past regulations. The system, by the way, is later copied in South Africa that becomes apartheid. Um, and uh, and uh, this meant that people couldn't leave without permission of the Indian agent. 
and he cut off their rations so they starved to death. So John A. MacDonald is not just a white supremacist. He, too, is an architect of genocide, quite specifically, directly himself. That was not a word that was used in 1887, 1886. But what he would have been called was a murderer. And that was against the law at that time in this country, too. All right? So we need to remember this when we uh, think about uh, commemorating people. So part and parcel, this whole process of colonization was to take the territories of indigenous peoples and to convert it to the private property of people of European origins. This links directly the project of colonization to the project of, of uh, uh, white supremacist exclusion of racialized Asians. The whole point was not to create a system of private property that they would benefit from, it was to create a system of private property that people of European and upper Canadian origins would vary from. Uh, um, this, by the way, I would argue, continues in the kinds of uh, yellow peril discourses that we see around uh, housing prices in Vancouver. But I only mention that because I'm bitter because I sold my house in Vancouver 22 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things I just want to draw your attention to here, just by way of, of, of uh, concluding this, is actually comes from another set of research. Um, uh, a very important work um, that uh, I think is also a, a fine piece of historical craft. And this is uh, uh, Timothy Snyder's book, Black Earth, The Holocaust as, uh, as History and as Warning. And Snyder is a disgusting person who reads 12 languages. And uh, he's reviewed the secondary literature and archival sources on the Holocaust. And so he really has, uh, how should we say, challenged everything I thought I knew about the Holocaust. So he's shown that it wasn't produced by a set of Nazi indoctrinated um, uh, people. It was produced by ordinary human beings. The first, the Holocaust starts with the massacre at Baba Yar outside of Kiev, conducted by the Reserve Bremen Police Unit. And after doing the murders, six months later when the rotation was up, they went back to Bremen to go back to issue parking tickets. And they wrote letters home justifying their actions, saying it was, was, was better for the Jews that we killed them because it was kinder, because otherwise they'd starve to death without pausing to think that perhaps the policy, Nazi policies they were enforcing was what was causing Jews to starve to death in the first place. Right? Uh, he shows how in different parts of Europe, uh, local populations who weren't Jewish actively participated uh, in their genocide. Um, mainly in order to get access to Jewish property. And, and he further argues that the basis of all genocides is property. And the way they work, and this is the warning part of this book, is first you create another. You create an us and an end. Then you say, why should they have so much when we have so little? And you say, okay, well, why don't we just redistribute some of their stuff to us? They, they tend to get a little bit upset. Okay, we'll remove them from this place. And then we can take their stuff. Now that we remove them from this place, the problem they might come back. So the solution there is, well, you kill them. And he argues that's the basis of all genocides. Of the, of the, the genocide, uh, the Armenian genocide, the Rwandan genocide, uh, and, and of other genocides. And much of that has been in the basis of genocides and attempted genocides in Canada, and continues to be today. So, um, of course, the histories that I've recounted today are not as straightforward as I've led on. White supremacy and colonization didn't emerge fully formed all at once. There were ongoing projects that needed to be recreated and needed to be taught. People, including those of European origins, also resisted these processes. They found ways of circumventing and inventing uh, new identities and ways of, of being. And I've shown this in my own research on how Chinese Canadians in this city invented the term Chinese Canadian in the face of a world where you had to be either Chinese or Canadian and you couldn't be both. They invented the term Chinese Canadian to perfectly articulate the reality of their lives as, as, as characterizing what Homi Baba would later call hybridity. 
that people like myself, and just to be clear, on my father's side of my family, I am like eighth and sixth, eighth generation white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. I've been an Empire Loyalist doc, if you please. On my mother's side, I'm third generation Chinese Canadian. So the fact that even people like myself can exist here is because of these forms of resistance and because of the fact that when left to their own devices, human beings find ways of working together on common projects despite their differences. Yet the dominance of white supremacy is not just something that happened at a distant past. It's continually being recreated in banal everyday acts, such as every time we use the names Victoria, British Columbia, George J. School, or celebrate John McDonald. Now, with the alternative narratives of Canada's history that I've touched on, one that takes racisms and colonialisms and moves them from the margins to the center, that establishes the racist foundations of Canadian historic formation, change the view of the racist trolls who deface this poster. Would it lead people to understand that Jagmeet Singh is a Sikh and not a Muslim? Would it have stopped the one third of Canadians who voted in the last election for the federal conservatives, either because of or despite their support for Islamic phobic uh, uh, proposed barbaric practices of it? Would it help our current Prime Minister to publicly condemn Quebec's new anti-milling law for its racist attack on Muslim women? Or it would make him, a certified teacher, actually decide to adequately fund First Nations schools in this, in this country? I fear not. I don't think it's just a question of replacing a bad history with a good history. But I think a history that starts from each of us and traces the complex ways in which we're connected to others across time, across space, and across difference just might do that. Thank you. Thank you.